Whether the team has given us the highest of highs or the bluest of blues, we'll cover it all here on Commander's Nightly News. I, of course, am your host, Louis T. Thank you for joining me. Let's get to tonight's lead story. Two in a row for the Washington Commanders. Victory Monday. Woo! Feels good, feels good. Haven't had one of these in a while. Remember, we had a Victory Friday last week. Not a Victory Monday. Haven't had one of these since week one. So this feels great. Two weeks in a row. I'm not dressed in all black like the Omen. This white kind of feels good. It feels right. Need to keep it going. Big win, 23-21 to 21 over the Green Bay Packers. I asked the team to show me, not tell me, show me that you were serious about making something of your season. This is a step in the right direction. We are not out of the woods yet. We are not at 500 yet, okay? But it feels good to not start the season off. And, you know, it's a pretty low bar that we've set. I, I get it. Um, but it feels good to not start the season off you know, two and six or one and five. Uh, we were trending in that direction. Just two weeks ago, we were one and four. And it seemed like we were heading for another one and five or two and six start to the season. But here we are at three and four. <clears throat> and there's some news that we'll talk about a little bit later on in the show that makes me smile. Now, it, it doesn't mean a thing. We got to go out and make it mean something. But Everything's trending up for this team right now. And yesterday's performance was good on so many levels. And I've talked about this team doing some good things, even in defeats. How you could see little things kind of coming together, but they still weren't, you know, making the plays that were necessary to turn a loss into a win. There was a play here or a play there. It's the little things, like downing a punt at the one-yard line right before halftime. Because that's the difference between Rodgers deciding, you know what, I want a field goal before halftime. And, getting, and having an opportunity to go for a field goal versus, hey, let's just go to halftime. That's the difference between, just, it's the little things, you know. Getting down there and, and Dax Milne fielding a punt at the 30-yard line on a dead sprint and getting to the 35 instead of him letting it hit the ground and it taking a Packers bounce and we start the possession at the 13-yard line. That's what's been happening when we would lose games. And instead, this is what it takes to win. For It's just the little things. You don't really even pay attention to them. You weren't thinking about a Dax Milne punt, but that saves 15 to 20 yards of field position. It changes how you go about calling plays. It changes everything. Getting off the field on third downs, 0 of 6. I've been talking about this stat all year long, and because we were losing, you guys didn't want to hear that stat. But I've been talking about this team's, go back three, four weeks ago, when I sat on one show in particular and gave you the defensive third down statistics and said, hey, this is a winning formula moving forward. You can win ball games doing this on third downs. This team has been good on third downs all season. Nobody wanted to talk about that because you're losing football games. But I said, if you can start playing better offense, I said, this defense stands for week number two against Detroit. This defense has given us a chance in every single game. That includes the debacle against the Eagles in week three and the 25 or 25 to 10 loss or whatever it was to Dallas in week four. This defense gave us a chance every single week except for week number two. And they've been playing solid football. They've been getting off the field on third downs. The only thing they really haven't done is create turnovers. Special teams said, don't worry. We'll help out in that department. Defense still isn't creating a ton of turnovers. All right? But special teams said, we'll do our part. We'll, we'll chip in. And we'll give you a little bit of a hand. So we'll take it any way we can get it. It's still not a finished product. We got a long way to go. By no means is, is this team dangerous. By no means is this team one that anyone should fear. By no means is this a playoff caliber football team. However, they're trending in that direction. And that's all you can ask for. After starting from where we started up from. At one and four, to be three and four, to have a chance next week to make it four and four, 
and to be playing with the kind of momentum that we need going into some of these big games that are coming up. It's a big step in the right direction. And to see some of these young guys, look, we killed Ron Rivera. We killed Marty Herney, Martin Mayhew, and all of the staff for some of these guys that they brought in. Electing to go young at positions where we thought they needed veteran help, like defensive tackle. John Ridgway has been outstanding. We talked about them feverishly, criticized them harshly. I was guilty of it about not going out and getting a veteran corner, instead going out and getting Rashad Wild Goose and Castro Fields. And these guys have made plays, whether it be on special teams or in the case of Rashad Wild Goose playing a pivotal role defensively in helping his team turn it around. You're seeing the linebacker step up. We criticized them for not doing enough at the linebacker position. Talked about them as if they had done something to our grandmother about selecting Jamin Davis in the first round. Quietly, he's putting together a hell of a sophomore campaign. Again, things take time and Ron's not out of the woods. One week, two weeks don't make a, a, you know, a 180 degree change. There are still some things that frustrate us with this team, with the coaching staff. It was a better day for Scott Turner. He's still not what we want him to be yet. But he's bought himself another week. Winning cures all. I'll just say that. It's amazing where we were two weeks ago wanting everyone's head on a silver platter, pitchforks and torches out, wanting the entire staff's, uh, you know, head on a stick individually wanted everybody gone and wanted to start anew what we're asking questions some of you are still asking questions about uh sam howe and rightfully so i i get i understand because this the taylor heineke thing is usually a means to an end at some point you're gonna have that that rude awakening and like this wasn't a clean taylor heineke performance it he didn't lie to you. Last year, he lied to us. We got him in week one. He didn't do anything crazy in week one, right? Gave us a chance, but we didn't get it done. Yeah. Week two, he goes out, or week three, or two, uh, excuse me, he goes out and plays his brains out. And we're like, oh my God, wait a minute. We might have found something. Week three, big environment at Buffalo. Fine, I get it. Week four, he plays his brains out again. And you're thinking, maybe we got something here, man. Maybe we have something here. And then the rest of the season happened, and you kind of saw that, okay, he's really solid, but he's a backup. This, this game, he showed you, the, he gave you the full Taylor Heineke experience. <laughs> you got everything. So you can't say that you were lied to this time around. You got the pick six. You got a couple of moon balls that hung up in the air forever. You got the poise and the moxie to, to maneuver within the pocket. You saw the legs. He takes off and runs. He extends plays, makes plays with his arm, uh, you know, gives guys a chance down the field, throws a very catchable football with beautiful touch like the Antonio Gibson throw in the back of the end zone. And then on some pressure situations, backpedaling, getting the football to Terry on three different occasions, including the game ceiling uh, reception to really put the game in uh, on ice, essentially, on third down and long. You got the full experience, the near fumble and scoop and score. Like, without that penalty, it's a totally different game. You got it all. But we won. Had we lost, a lot of people that sing in that Taylor Heineke tune would have been t saying a, a, a whole different thing today. But I'll say this, and, and I acknowledged this last week. I'm going to acknowledge it even more so now because having watched the game uh, uh, multiple times now and just looking at the environment and a lot of people that were at the game including my guy Abel Ambrosio, who uh, was the recipient of the MOBB tickets for week number seven. Everyone said the, the environment, the energy was alive. 
at the stadium. That it was a rock. And there are a lot of Packers fans. The Packers fans, the Steelers fans, the Cowboys fans, they travel like no other. Those three fan bases in particular, they're going to come in, they're going to infiltrate your stadium, and they may take over depending on how you're feeling that week. Your fans don't want to show up, they'll take your tickets. But they're coming in your building, whether you like it or not. But we held our own, and we were loud, and we were impactful, you know? So, um, and I think that's the Taylor Haneke effect. I'm going to be honest with you. As much as I hate to admit it, not because I dislike Taylor Haneke. You guys know, I love me some Taylor Haneke. He went to Old Dominion. Uh, he's a fellow monarch. I'm rooting for the dude, right? But understand, he's got limitations. I understand that. I am a realist. So I don't go in with unrealistic expectations for, for what I expect from Taylor Haneke. Some of you do. And that's okay. I told you I'm no dream crusher, Okay. Root for Taylor Heineke until your heart is content. Root for him to be the starter till your heart is content. I hope that they see the light if he continues to play this way. And we'll get to that in a second because an interesting question was asked of Ron Rivera today. And I thought his answer was, was the right answer, but it also provokes thought. So we'll get there in a second. But I said this, I want to say it was Friday. Maybe it was Thursday that Taylor Heineke produces excitement within this fan base and this team, for that matter, unlike any other player on this team, which is crazy because it's Taylor Heineke. I mean, (laughs) it's a great story. It's easy to rally behind on his sister's couch one week, studying for, you know, a math exam, and then the next week he's playing – in a playoff game, you know, or he's playing for the Washington Commanders in a playoff game against Tom Brady, you know? I mean, who who, who doesn't want to get behind that story? We've heard it a million times. We know, we know all of the players. We know all the particulars. We saw him for 15 games last year as a starter, did some really good things. But at the end of the day, he's a guy that, Players feed off his energy. He plays. I think Terry summed it up best yesterday after the game when he said he plays every single game, every single snap like it's his last. And that's kind of the mentality that Heineke has. And he said his as much when asked about Terry's comment. He said, yeah, I pretty much do because you don't know when it's going to be over. I didn't think I was ever going to play football again, he said. I thought my career was over. Remember, he told us, he, he called Scott Turner and said, hey, do you think you, you've got a spot for me or you could help me out getting a job as a coach in the league? And he said, hey, don't, don't give up yet. It's not over. It doesn't have to be. So this is a guy that understands that it could be here today, gone tomorrow, and he plays like it. How can you not root for that? And in doing that, there's there's this life and this energy that he breathes into this team. And you saw it. Like, some of that Terry emotion, that came from Heineke. Not just because Jair Alexander was talking shit and they were going back and forth and Terry wanted to give him work. Some of that was from Taylor Heineke. Heineke coming over there with the stank face, with the Heineke angry, I just made a play walk. Like what? And he said that was the best ball. That was the best rep him and Heineke have had for the last two years together. That's the best rep. Clearly, I I mean, that ball was perfectly thrown. Like Terry said, he couldn't have walked up and handed it to him any better. Partner. That was a great throw. Like, it fell out of the sky. And it just, like I said during the week, it permeates the, the entire roster, the entire staff. And really, this fan base has been rejuvenated. By Taylor Heineke. Now, that can only go so far because you got to produce on the field. But if he keeps playing this way, it's going to be damn hard to keep him out of the lineup. That's for sure. I'll say that. That was a gratifying win. And you know what else it was? It was fun to watch. 
There hasn't there haven't been many fun games this season. The last fun game that I actually had watching this team came in week number one against Jacksonville. That was the last fun game that I experienced. Every game isn't going to be a win, but it doesn't mean it has to be a a tough watch. You can have a fun game be a loss. It's not going to be as enjoyable at the end because you lost. But you can say, you know what? That was a damn good game we played. I'm proud of the fellas. Haven't been able to say that many times this season. This was a fun game to watch. Now, it was a hell of a roller coaster ride. You would prefer less you would prefer the bumps not to be as frequent. You would prefer not to have a pick six, not to have a damn near, you know, scoop and score. You know, you would prefer not to have, you know, a, a fumble that almost was that wasn't, but was damn close to being. You, you would you would prefer to not have all of these different emotions. Where you got three penalties, keep a drive alive, and ultimately lead to the opposition scoring a touchdown and cutting your lead from nine to two. You would much rather go without those bumps and those twists and turns. But damn it, it was fun. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the offense. I enjoyed the run game. I enjoyed Heineke. I enjoyed Terry. I enjoyed Curtis Samuel. I enjoyed the offensive line doing their jobs. I enjoyed the secondary getting it done. I enjoyed the linebackers. I enjoyed the special teams. I did not enjoy Joey Sly missing a damn kick, but I enjoyed the game. And I can't help but think about Taylor Heineke because if this were Carson Wentz, this outcome would not have been what it was. I feel very confident in saying that. The Packers blitzed a ton in this game. And it was Heineke's ability to know where to go with the football, to know where his outlets were, to make quick decisions, to backpedal away from pressure and get it to a guy. It was his anticipation. It was him knowing where to go with the football. Escaping the pocket. In and out, weaving in and out, up the A-gap. Multiple times. Even on the play that he got hit and fumbled. It was his ability to maneuver and orchestrate this offense that gave us a chance to enjoy this particular game. Hopefully that continues with less mistakes and turnovers, but this is a good start. That's for sure. So Washington's got their first win streak of the season. That's two in a row against two NFC North opponents. I talked about this before the season started. We need to go six and two First, the two divisions that we're playing, one in the NFC, in the NFC North, and one in the AFC, in the AFC South. Now, we've got an AFC South opponent coming up this week. That's where we're heading now. In other news, before we jump into what Ron had to say, and he had his uh, Victory Monday presser today, there was news today that broke involving our Week 8 opponent in the Indianapolis Colts. I'm pretty sure most of you are privy to this news. However, Indianapolis Colts starting quarterback Matt Ryan sprained his shoulder on Sunday in week seven in their loss to the Tennessee Titans, 19 to 10. Thus, he will be out in week eight and Washington will be getting the very first start of second year signal caller Sam Ellinger for the Indianapolis Colts. If this is not setting up for us, then I don't know what is. Now, Ellinger is more mobile than Matt Ryan, so that does, you know, change a little bit and add a different element that we weren't planning for. He, their quarterback will no longer be a sitting duck, but he also is not as savvy and wise and quick with the football and accurate and all the things that Matt Ryan brings to the table. He's not any of those things, okay? He's Sam Ellinger. So there's added pressure now. Before, it's like, oh, you know, Indianapolis... You know, they might beat Washington. They should beat Washington. They're at home. Uh, Washington, I think, started out as six-point underdogs. I think that number came down to four and a half after um, our win. I'm not sure that number may come down even further now that Matt Ryan is not in the game. Who's to say? But at the end of the day, I, I'm not expecting anything. I'm, 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 I think right now I'm still in that wait and see mode. I don't want to go all in with this team because I've been there before. I've done that and I'm not doing that right now. They've got to show me more. This was a good step in the right direction, as I said, but they've got to show me more. 
So I'm not willing to go too far out on the deep end with this team because of their history with me and past transgressions that have led to uh, copious amounts of anger from me, your man, Louis T. So I reserve the judgment um, of expecting anything. I'll continue to hope that this team takes advantage of opportunities like the one that is being presented to them in week number eight with a guy making his first career NFL start. That said, that could be a trap. He could come out and kick our ass. But if I'm Washington, I'm making Sam Ellinger beat us, which means, and we'll get into this as the week progresses, which means Jonathan Taylor and Naheem Hines can't have a big game. You can't let the run game be the crutch that allows Sam, Sam Ellinger to ease his way into his first career NFL start. You got to kick their ass in the run game and make sure that Sam Ellinger's right arm is the reason that the Colts win the football game. And if he does, again, you tip your cap. I said the same thing about Aaron Rodgers this past week. Look, if they're going to beat us, I know it sounds crazy, but this isn't the same Packers that we're used to and, and accustomed to seeing. Make Aaron Rodgers beat you because right now they're not in a position to do that. If the run game is solid for them, it's going to give them an opportunity to beat us. The reason we scored 20 unanswered points in this game is because the Packers, one, refused to run the football, two, weren't having a ton of success, but they were having enough, and I thought they should have stick, stuck with the run. But that said, it's not our fault. That's not our problem that they didn't continue to run the football. But when they did run it, there wasn't a ton there. So we got to make sure that stays the same and we've been stopping around. I talked about this, you know, for the last three or four weeks now. Since the since Cam uh, Curl came back after the first two weeks where we were getting gutted on the ground, the run defense has been superb. You know, there have been a couple of situations where teams have gotten some good hits. Obviously, the Bears game with the big one run. But outside of that, that in the, in the, in the Justin Fields run, the defense on the ground was solid again. And so... I just that's going to be a big you know point of emphasis this week if you know when it comes to this Colts game. But enough of that. It's Monday. We're still celebrating the win from week number seven. We'll get to week eight, and we'll have plenty of time to do that as the week progresses. But uh, Ron spoke to the media as he always does uh, the day after a game. Uh, normally, it's a day after presser, but th for the last two weeks, it's been a victory presser uh, in terms of now victory Monday it was victory Friday last week. Victory Monday this week. And again, you know, I, I think Ron is starting to feel like the fruits of their labor are starting to pay off. And I myself have been hypercritical, as, as many of you have as well. And again, they deserved every bit of criticism that was launched in their direction because um, they made some questionable decisions. But decisions are only questionable when you give us reason to doubt. Sometimes we're impatient and we don't like to wait for results to happen. We just go off of the initial results. And if those initial results come back somewhat skeptical, we jump to a conclusion and we don't give you the benefit of the doubt. And this team doesn't deserve the benefit of the doubt when it comes to anything because they haven't produced winning football on the field. So when you produce a shit product off the field and then the product on the field isn't that much better, you don't get the benefit of the doubt. So when we see a Jamin Davis and the results initially aren't what we expected them to be, there's doubt. We're jumping to a conclusion. We're drawing an inference. When we go out and don't sign any veteran corners, and we bring in a couple of youngins, one with the last name of Wild Goose, and he's getting cooked in his first career game here in Washington, we look at you with the side eye and we say, what the hell are you doing? Are you trying to make us lose? We didn't give him any time to progress. We didn't give him any time to assimilate to this defense. We just said, this guy's ass. You made a mistake. We were all waiting to see Antonio Gibson in this role of weapon, and this, that wasn't their fault. You know, they couldn't have foresaw what was to come with, you know, is it foresaw even a word? They couldn't have foreseen what was to come with um, Brian Robinson getting shot and the delay that that would cause to 
the visions that they had for this offense and in particular the backfield. But we've seen that now come to fruition and it's a thing of beauty. I still don't trust Scott Turner because he has to prove to me that on a regular work week, he can be creative. This is the second time we've seen him get into his bag as a play caller. And the first time was when he had over a month to prepare for the Jacksonville Jaguars. So he threw out all the stops in week one. We were all kinds of creative. Curtis Samuel had like five or seven carries in week one. He didn't have many carries the rest of the season until week number seven. Why did he have a, no, a number of carries? Why was Scott Turner so creative? My, my narrative is, my inference that I'm drawing, okay, is that he had more time. He had 11 days to prepare for the Green Bay Packers with the short work week last week and the extra time on the back end of that. I want to see if he can be creative when there's a regular work week. We don't play in 11 days. We play in six days from now. Can he put together a play, uh, a program and a, a, a um, can he put together a game plan rather, not a program, a game plan that is as creative as it was on Sunday against a Colts defense that's going to be better than the one we just faced in the Green Bay Packers. Better than the one we faced on Thursday in the Chicago Bears. I'm anxious to see. But Ron, I think Ron felt not necessarily vindicated but he's starting to kind of puff his chest out a bit. Like, see, I told you, bitches. Told you, mother effers. Just let me work, all right? He ain't done nothing yet, and he knows that. And that's why he's not going overboard with it. But he, he was, he had a shit eating grin today, you know? Because a lot of the things that he was hoping, and he said this in his press conference after the game last night. Like, some of these young boys, I was expecting them to come in and contribute right away. Like, we need them to speed up the damn process of them getting acclimated. They can't take as long because we're, we're counting on them. He talked about the youth of this roster, and he's like, yo, I need these young boys to step their shit up. They making me look bad. He's like, and I want to get some of these young boys in there. I want to get Percy Butler in there. I want to play Sip a little bit more. That's, you know, he always makes sure he tells us because he assumes that we don't know who Sip is. We know it's Christian Holmes. You don't have to say his entire government after you say his nickname. We know, all right? There, there are people out there that don't know. But if you're diehards like us, if you're following the team, we know who Sip is. You don't have to keep telling us after every time you say Sip. Um, he's like, I want these guys to play more, but the veterans are playing well, so I can't get them on the field as much. He gave Jack some credit. Nobody wanted to give Jack shit. I told y'all, get off of Jack's back. <laughs> Nobody wanted to give Jack any credit early in the season. I'm like, you can, you can blame a lot of aspects of this team. Don't blame the defense. Jack's doing a really good job. Now, we don't hear any Jack slander. Jack was the guy that everybody wanted fired after week two. I haven't heard a mention of Jack Del Rio's name in over a month. Defense is playing well. Everything's starting to fall into place. They fired Sam Mills. This defensive line is playing out of their minds. He looks like a genius for making that move. The biggest thing Ron said today, though, there were two things, actually. He talked about this team feeding off the energy of Taylor Heineke. I, I just spent time talking about that. It's, that's a real thing. Whether you like it or you don't like it, that's a real thing. There's, an, there's, it, there's a certain aura about Heineke, his play, and what it does to this team. Look, he's going to make mistakes. Damn it, he's going to make mistakes. There's a Ryan Fitzpatrick quality to Taylor Heineke. He, there is. There's an excitement that he brings. There's this life that, you know, an energy that he brings to the table that it's easy to rally behind. And Ron had to acknowledge that. But the biggest thing Ron said was when he was asked, by Pete Haley, and I swear Pete be asking some damn good questions because Pete's locked into what the fans want to know. So, and Pete's not afraid to ask. Pete said, so 
if you get into a position in a predicament where Heineke plays well, would you entertain potentially making a change there and making this a permanent thing? To which Ron responded, he, he said, would he, Pete phrased it as, would you feel pressure? Would you feel pressure to make a move? And to which Ron responded, no, I wouldn't feel pressured. However, we got to get there first. And I've said that already. It's Haneke's job to prove to the staff that I'm the guy for the job, that I should be the starter long term for the remainder of this season. It's his job to prove that. It's not Carson Wentz's job. It's not the staff's job. It's Haneke's job to prove to them that he's the right man for the job. And if he can do that, then they have a decision to make. And Ron said, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. But we're not there yet. And he's right. All I need from Ron is that you're thinking. This could be a real thing. And this may be a decision that I have to make. And he's acknowledging that. And that's all I want from him at this moment. He doesn't have to make a decision now, next week, or even the week after that. He doesn't have to make that decision for a month from now. But if this continues and we keep winning ball games clearly the offense was way better than it's been since week one okay this offense was six of or seven of 16 on third downs we haven't had more than two third down conversions in the last two weeks we were two of 11 last week against chicago and we were one of 11 the week prior to that against tennessee this offense was way better we rushed the football effectively because we threw it effectively. We converted third downs. There's no way they can look at this team offensively and say, it's not better with Heineke under center. But he's going to have to do this consistently. Can't be one week here, next week you suck. One week, uh, Next week you're really good again. The next week you're turning it over and we lose again. If you're going to do that, might as well put you know, Carson Wentz back in the game. So it's going to be interesting. I'll just say that. But I know Ron is thinking, just like with the Sam Cosme question, Sam did not play last, yesterday. I, I, he doesn't have to make a decision on that. But if Sam comes back and they have an issue at left guard, Sam could go inside. We've gotten to the point now where Wes Schweitzer is eligible to come off of IR. That's another decision that they can make. I, they're not going to do anything right now. Nor should they. Andrew Norwell hasn't been playing poorly. So I don't think they're going to do anything there right now. I told you I like my West Schweitzer coming off the bench. So if it's not broke, we don't need to fix it right now. And it's not broken right now. So I'll just say this. Winning produces a lot of excitement and optimism. And in this particular case, it poses some, some good problems. To have. Now, you lose, and all of a sudden, that optimism wanes, and now, instead of having good problems, you've got bad problems. They need to continue to win. And I'll leave it at that. And they're going to have another great opportunity. Not a good, a great opportunity. I said that last week. I'm like, this is the best opportunity you're going to have to beat Green Bay. Because... This is not the Packers team that I am accustomed to seeing. And you saw it on Sunday with your own eyes. You didn't have to believe me when I told you that. You got to see it for yourself. That's not the same Green Bay Packers that you're accustomed to seeing. These Indianapolis Colts, solid club, but they don't scare anybody. And now with Matt Ryan being out, it's amazing how this game went from a revenge game with Carson Wentz and Matt Ryan and trying to have that be a referendum on the decision the Colts made to all of a sudden, there's no Carson Wentz and there's no Matt Ryan. It's Taylor Heineke against Sam Ellinger. Who would have thought that a month ago? Boy, the NFL is a wicked, wicked game. And boy, do we love it, especially after a win. No major injuries from the game other than Cole Turner. We were right about him. It was a concussion. Don't know the status. More likely than not, he probably won't be available for the upcoming game against the Indianapolis Colts. We'll wait until Wednesday. We'll get word on whether uh, you know they'll start the clock 
on uh, Chase Young, which means if he's practicing this week, if he's no longer on the side field, if he's actually getting work, like we saw with um, like we saw with Tyler Larson and some of the other guys that started, and Logan Thomas and some of the other guys that started the season on the pup list, if he's starting to get work with his teammates, um, then we can maybe expect him to play on Sunday. I still com- contend that it'll be week nine. They want him to start his season at home in front of the home faithful. I think he, that it's going to be week nine against the Minnesota Vikings, but it could be week eight against the Indianapolis Colts. Uh, what a great time for him to come back if it were, because they got a young quarterback that's going to be a deer in headlights, I'm thinking, and we're going to have an opportunity to maybe you know make some things happen defensively. It'd be really great to have 99 out there wreaking havoc. So uh, anyway, uh, I digress. Damn, it feels feels good to win, man. Feels good, feels good. <laughs> Two in a row. Whew. Uh, we're not done yet. I'm not satisfied, nor should you, but man, it feels good. Damn, it feels good. Anyway, I digress. It's going to do it for me, your man, Louis T. Uh, one more question before I go. I wanted to ask you guys, have the jerseys, have they grown on you yet? That was our second look at the legacy burgundy jerseys. That's what they call them. Um, the, the burgundy tops with the white bottoms. We still haven't seen burgundy on burgundy. Um, we've seen white on white and we've seen white on burgundy. So we know what those two color combinations look like. Uh, we've seen black on white. We haven't seen, I, I think we wore black on black against Dallas. We haven't seen black on white. I don't think we'll ever see black on burgundy, but I, I, I can't say that we won't, but I don't think we will. And uh, we haven't seen burgundy on burgundy. But having seen all three of the color schemes and all three of the jerseys now, um, not all three of the, you know, not all of the color schemes that you could put together with the different combinations that we could throw out there, but just having seen all of the jerseys now, have they grown on you? I, I've taken a certain liking to the home field look now with the burgundy end zones and the, you know, burgundy tops. I prefer that over the white tops at home. So what says you? you know, yesterday, you know, I, I felt this, this weirdness yesterday. It'll never feel like I'm watching the Redskins. But for a Sunday last yesterday, it felt Redskinish to me. Just, just a tad bit, not a lot. It'll never be the Redskins. But it, for just a second, when Terry caught that touchdown and he got up, I was like, hmm, this actually feels good. Anyway, I'd love to hear how you guys feel about the jerseys. Like, you don't have to get very, you don't have to get super deep. How do you feel about the jerseys? Have they grown on you? Do you still, do you abhor them still? Uh, are you indifferent about them? It is what it is. Um, how do you feel about the jerseys? All right. That's going to do it for me, your man, Louis T. Look forward to chopping it up with you again tomorrow. Um, you know, we'll, we'll get into the film. We'll get into studs and duds for all of the Mob Squad members out there. And then we will turn the page to the Indianapolis Colts on Wednesday where we'll be live. And um, there's a lot of, you know, energy surrounding this team right now. And it's building and you're hoping that we get Jahan Dotson back, that you get Logan Thomas. I think we're going to get Logan Thomas back this week. That'll be a huge boost for the offense. And you're hoping to get some of these, you know, guys that we, we look at as key contributors back. It, it's amazing. You're winning football games. You're still not fully healthy. You got guys on the men that are coming back. The cavalry is going to arrive at some point, and it's going to make this team even more potentially dangerous. And so I like where we sit. I don't love where we sit. I don't, I don't ever want to be under 500. That's not something I look forward to. But uh, if you're going to find yourself at one and four, this is the response you're looking for. Instead of, you know, burying your head in the sand and digging yourself a deeper hole like we usually do, one and four usually turns into one and five or two and five turns into two and six. We fought back earlier this time around, which is going to give you an opportunity to fight. You look at the rest of the conference. I, I can't stress this enough. San Francisco lost yesterday. They're three and four. The Arizona Cardinals are three and four. The Green Bay Packers, who we just beat, are now three and four, and we now hold the tiebreaker over them. So if we look up late in the season and they're fighting for a wild card just like we are, we got the tiebreaker over them. These are important games that we're playing. 
Got to find a way to start beating NFC teams. That's why beating Chicago is big. Beating Green Bay is big. That's why when we play Minnesota, that's going to be a big game. We got to take care of the AFC South. You cannot afford to lose the teams that you need to start beating. This is the right time for us to start turning the season around. All right. Continue to enjoy the two-game heater. We'll be back on Tuesday to talk about more things going on with this football team. Until then, I'm your man, Louis T. See you next time. Here comes the diesel. Here comes the diesel. There's the snap. Hand to Riggins. Good hole. He's got the first down to the 40. He's gone. The 35, the 30, the 20. He's gone. He's gone.